Chapter 8 Laban's Long Shadow One of the things that pilgrims love to do along the trail is tell stories. The tales they spin are usually about people much like themselves, stories full of devotion and faith, toil and danger, hardship and blessing. Perhaps you are familiar with one of my favorites. It has many characters, the most memorable and I might say the most unpleasant of which is a Bedouin named Laban. If that name does not ring a bell, I am sure you will remember the protagonist of the story, a poor wandering pilgrim named Jacob. He is the center around which this pilgrim tale revolves, and no doubt you are familiar with his part in the story. But unknown to most, Jacob's manipulative father-in-law has lessons to teach us as well. Leaving out two wives and two concubines, a herd of goats and a flock of children, the plot goes something like this. A powerful man named Laban sees the powerless young Jacob as a resource he can use. The older man skillfully manipulates events so that he can extract every last drop from the younger. Laban's personal ambition makes him blind to the divine purpose residing in his son-in-law. The story is a perfect illustration of the powerful using the weak, an image the pilgrim should never forget. Several years ago I met another Jakob in Central Asia, but I refused to say who his Laban was. This Jakob was also young, gifted, and bright. He had previously gone to a seminary far away to study theology, but now he was back and ready for ministry in his homeland. This Central Asian Jacob had found himself a Rahel. Thankfully, there is no Leah in this story, who was an outstanding evangelist in her own right. Considering the spiritual pedigree they carried as singles, everyone was expecting miracles from this young married couple. Before the wedding bells had stopped ringing, various missionaries were in a lively competition for the use of their combined gifts. As a natural administrator, Jacob could prove a great help at any mission office, and Rahel's gift of evangelism would be a blessing anywhere. The winning bidder was a pilgrim who had planted a small church, but now was ready to move on. In a whirlwind decision, Jacob was installed as pastor and given a small salary to prove it. It appeared to be the crowning moment of a missionary church planting effort, the baton being passed from a pilgrim who was leaving the field to a gifted local leader who would carry on the work. Whenever a dynamic foreign missionary is in charge of a church, there will always be ready sources of foreign cash, such as organizational money or the open wallets of short term pilgrims. But once a local like Jacob takes over, money can become as scarce as shade on the step. Furthermore, the pilgrim who was leaving had a charismatic personality that drew thirsty people like a spring of fresh water. Jacob, although outgoing and friendly, could never live up to the size of those footprints. Worst of all, it seems that no one had asked Jacob and Rahal what their vision for ministry might be. Did they really feel called to pastor this church? The story becomes even more complicated. While busy trying to build up the little church, Jacob's administrative gift was still in demand. And since his heart was as big as his gift, he often found himself doing the bidding of others. One missionary might need him to process visas for his friends, another to help plan a project. Whenever a pilgrim needed the help of a skilled and diligent administrator, Jacob's phone rang. One day, he would be looking after the flock he had been given, the next, making arrangements for a short-term team. A few weeks later, he could be planning a conference for someone. There is nothing wrong with any of this, except that none of these things had sprung from Jacob's own heart. Before long, our tale turns tragic filled with defeat and heartbreak. Since the baton Jacob and Rahal had been passed was not their vision, the church soon folded. This seems to happen whenever someone attempts to fulfill another person's dreams, especially at the expense of their own. 
It seems that we pilgrims usually don't ask local leaders what their visions are because we are too busy thinking about our own. We find it easier to use them as a means to reach our dreams than to help them explore theirs. This is dangerous ground for the pilgrim, for once we start using hard-working local believers as a cheap labor to build our shrines and caravansaries, we have become no different than the worthless character Laban, whom we encountered at the beginning of this tale. Sometimes I fear that we have unwittingly become accustomed to using people in our religious structures back home, where accomplishments are more important than relationships. God's flock can easily become just another means to a self-glorifying end. It should be obvious to the sincere pilgrim that using people is no way to build a community, but like many other things that should be obvious, this can be hidden by our personal agendas. Worse yet, when we act like modern-day Labans, we leave lingering shadows that will haunt the future of the indigenous church and its leadership. You might be wondering what happened to Jacob and Rahel. After their church closed, the rumor mill churned with speculation. Some pilgrims searched for some secret sin that the couple must have been hiding. Others assumed they were just plain lazy, but worst of all was the ugly label whispered around town that they were failures. A few of the pilgrims who had previously admired them went so far as to warn others to steer clear of Jacob, as if he had something contagious. Perhaps Jacob and Rahal had failed, but at what? Fulfilling someone else's dreams? Instead, should we not ask, who failed them? Who had failed them by acting a little too much like Laban and using them rather than encouraging them to pursue their own calling? Thankfully, in the dry air of Central Asia, most wounds heal quickly. Jacob and Rahel were soon strong enough to do what few are willing to even consider. They moved to an untouched region and started over deciding that it was better to pioneer than to plod along on someone else's path. It is still too early to tell what the results will be, for this brave young couple has been called to toil in some very hard soil. But I have a feeling that their new ministry will bear fruit because they are finally walking in their own calling. Yet, to do that, they had to walk so far from Laban's long shadow that no one could use them except God alone.